Hi, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's been a little while since I've put something on here, but I thought today I would uh, share something that's relevant for this time of the year and also as a reflection on the years to come and what we've just been through this year. It's been a pretty tough time with all the COVID things happening all around the world. And uh, people have um, struggled with it. Some people have um, used it as a time to ponder the real meaning of life, I guess. And some people have really struggled. Some people, unfortunately, have lost their lives. Uh, there's been a lot of tension uh, amongst people because of the COVID thing. But uh, this time of the year, as we come to Christmas, I thought I would reflect on once, I, which I something I have done once before on my blog, and I'll re refer back to that as we go. But um, I thought I'd reflect on the real meaning of Christmas. But this time of the year, of course, you know, we are being told all the time. And if you frequent YouTube channels like I do, you're always looking at people unboxing the latest thing, either their old film camera that they've just got and are excited about, or some brand new camera that they're un unboxing. Everyone gets caught up in the whole material thing. Not only us photographers, but everything else under the sun. People are being encouraged. We get brochures in the mail. We get emails telling us to buy this and buy that. We have Black Fridays and all that sort of stuff. And uh, we are urged to buy, buy, buy. And we're thinking about the material world. Now, I'm reflecting at this time of the year about my material world. Normally, this bookshelf behind me is chock-a-block full of books. They're all on the floor down there at the moment. And also there's another bookshelf usually on this side of me as well. And uh, that's um, all on the floor. And a lot of stuff I'm sort of uh, shuffling around because I'm trying to declutter declutter both my mind, my spiritual life, and get back to the basics. So with that, I would like to just introduce this little booklet that I have here. I'm going to read a little bit from it. Uh, you'll find on this channel um, sermons, actually audio sermons, by a Mr. Frank Hunting, who was one of my pastors many years ago and a, a wonderful mentor to our family. And um, he's the one that really, his teaching kept me involved in in staying a Christian, really, after I'd become a Christian. And, um, and I thought I would reflect on what he wrote some years ago. I'll read a little bit of it. Um, it's very hard when I've found it very hard to stay locked into thinking about my faith over this last eight or nine months with the COVID thing. When you're not regularly meeting with the people you normally meet with it on a Sunday in church or whatever, it's very easy to just drop away and, and just get lazy on, on doing the discipline to stay focused on Jesus and focused on your faith. I've written about that myself to try and encourage myself and, and I've spoken about it on this YouTube channel as well about uh, developing the right habits and I still find it even though I've been a Christian for nearly 50 years now I still find it difficult to to develop right habits so at the moment I'm trying to declutter as I said and I want to reflect today on the the real meaning of Christmas this is a little book that that Frank wrote some years ago towards the end of his life he wrote a number of devotional books which were based on on his um, <coughs> Uh, thoughts when he was having a daily quiet time every day with God and he wrote down his thoughts and he put this one this year uh, as it was leading up to Christmas he decided to write and share some of his thoughts on it now I'm going to read a little bit the first two or three pages <coughs> excuse me but um, I'm going to also put links to my blog because some years back I put the whole of this booklet on my blog in serial form you can actually read the actual text if you, and I'll put the links in underneath on this um, on this uh, video today, so that if you want to go back and read the whole book, you can. It's there. And uh, but anyway, without further ado, I'm going to read from Frank Hunting's little book called "Is This the Real Christmas? The Way It Really Was." And uh, just a little bit of a preamble in the acknowledgments he writes about here. He says. Over a long lifetime, as the birth of Jesus, generally called Christmas, has come around, it has been more and more paganised and commercialised. As this has increased, I have shut it more and more out of my life and have turned to the simple but extremely beautiful account of this all-important event, as recorded in the Gospels. As the years have passed, I believe I have been able to more and more respond to the exquisite beauty of the birth of Jesus as told by Luke and Matthew. 
Now the first uh, uh, meditation is called Pondering. So we'll see how we go with that. And this is Frank's words, of course. In these thoughts, provoked by meditating on the birth of Jesus, I have turned away from being sentimental about Jesus' birth. The birth of Jesus does provoke in me some of the most profound emotions of which I am capable, but I am quite inadequate to be able in words to describe my feelings. A few times I have used the word Christmas, but I've been most reluctant to do so. The way we moderns celebrate the birth of Jesus, calling it Christmas, has very little about it that even remotely resembles what actually took place when Jesus was born. There are many things tenaciously held today as being part of Christmas concerning which we know nothing. Did Mary ride a donkey from Nazareth to Bethlehem? <clears throat> it is most unlikely. Joseph and Mary were extremely poor as the offering they made in the temple shows. We don't know the year Jesus was born, let alone the month and the day or the time, and we seem never likely to know. The inn from which Mary was crowded out can be misleading. The truth is, we have nothing comparable in our Western world, even remotely, like the Khan, that's spelt K-A-H-N, to which Joseph and Mary came. And we only roughly know what the Khan may have been like. It certainly was nothing like an inn to which a modern traveller in the Western world may come, nor do we know the exact site where the Khan was. Most are reasonably sure three kings came to worship Jesus when he was born. The wise men from the east were Magi. They were not kings at all. We have no idea how many there were. It may have been three, but it could have been two or ten, we do not know. It is most unlikely they were at the birth of Jesus because it was a house to which they came to lay their gifts before Jesus. And it may have been up to two years after the birth of Jesus that they arrived. I was only at a local Bible study the other night. We were just all contemplating on those very facts, actually. Now, these are all things we do not know about the birth of Jesus, nor are we ever likely to know them. Thus it is, I have most briefly looked at and thought about some of the things God has said in his word concerning the birth of his Son, who is our glorious Saviour. It was two months or more before Christmas 1992 that I decided I would enjoy some of the wonder and exquisite beauty there is in God's account of the birth of his son that I leisurely tried to reconstruct in the pictures of my mind the breathtakingly glorious things God did when his son came to this world in order to become our saviour. It became a truly marvellous Christmas for me. He says all the Bible quotes in this book that have been taken from the old King James Version. So, we'll go on to the next heading, The People God Used. Subheading, The Birth of Jesus. In the first chapters of Luke, we have God breaking out of eternity, which is his abiding place in time, into time and space, which is our abiding place. He came out of his abiding place to ours. And as always, when God does this, he does something which only God can do. When God breaks out of eternity, what is done could only be done by the God the Bible reveals to us. No one else but God could do it. It may be that when we come to think and talk about Christmas, which is really the birth of Jesus, we relegate God to a background role. We have him very much in the shadows. This is characteristic of God. When he is dominating the scene, he is least observable. When God actually dominates what is happening, we can o easily overlook him. He is almost obscure. The birth of Jesus is in numerous re respects the most wonderful and amazing action by God in the world's whole story. Yet we need to deliberately stop, think if we can, of the full meaning of all that is taking place here on earth. Then lift our thoughts right above what we see to the amazing God who has planned it all and is now bringing it all to pass and doing it perfectly. Not one in all of Israel realised at the time Zechariah and Elizabeth lived that, that, uh, that the nation's greatest need was a thoroughgoing repentance producing a thoroughgoing change. 
that would enable the nation to receive Jesus, their long-desired Messiah, which would be for their greatest possible good. Now, only God saw this. John's ministry was an offer to Israel of a repentance that would bring about change, a change that would result in the most wonderful relationship with God the nation had ever known. And so it can be for us. We heard then of Elizabeth and Zacharias. So we, we just focus now on Elizabeth and then I'll read a little bit about both her and her husband and then I might stop there and put some messages in the footnotes. So Elizabeth, Zacharias had a wife and her name was Elizabeth. you find that in Luke 1 verse 5. Elizabeth is one of the most beautiful women you are ever likely to read about. When I talk about her beauty, I am not alluding to her physical beauty. She may have been physically beautiful, but by the time we read about her, whatever physical beauty she once had has faded with the passing of long years. The beauty of Elizabeth was a beauty far from passing as the long years came and went by, but and went, but is increased. It grew and blossomed, ever becoming more lovely. For Elizabeth's beauty was a beauty of soul and character, a loveliness, a loveliness quite priceless. It grew out of a beautiful devotion to God, and as the years passed, her life took on some of the glorious loveliness of God. God in his word sums up the character of Elizabeth in one word, righteous. Don't scurry past that word. When spoken by God, it says much much more than you may at first think. For crowded into it all is all that is finest and noblest and splendid and possible to a human being. And in Elizabeth's case, it is something God sees about her. And we quote from the scripture. And they, Elizabeth and her husband, were both righteous before God. And Frank says God sees men and women quite differently from the way we do. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Whew, what a matchless praise, and coming from God too. Do you want to be truly great, great in the eyes of God? Do you want to be truly beautiful in soul and character and personality? And this in the eye of God? Then ponder Mary and Joseph and Zacharias and Elizabeth, whom God chose to be closest to his great and matchless son, Jesus, when he, from the realms of unspeakable glory, was born into this world of ours. I will read on. I know the, uh, the message is getting a little bit longer now. I'll just read on a little bit from God's kind of people. And then in the text below, you'll be able to check up and, and read all of these pages for yourself. God's kind of, kind of people. Zacharias and Elizabeth... Joseph and Mary. The simplicity, the ordinariness in the lives of the people involved in the birth of Jesus is quite frightening when you meditate on it. All who are involved in the birth of Jesus are ordinary people, very ordinary. So ordinary they were, were they, if it hadn't been for the coming of Jesus, we would not have known a single thing about them. They had, had absolutely none of the things we look for in the lives of those we want to call great. Not one single thing to which we would attach the word great did they do. And it's just that which makes the lives they lived a little frightening when we think on it. We belong to a nation. We're talking about Australia here, but you can translate this to your own country probably. We belong to a nation, a culture which places abnormal importance in what we do. It is do, do, do. We also have a culture which gives little or no importance to what we are. Do not our leaders, to cover up what they are, constantly tell us that we have no right to scan the private lives of important public figures? As long as these important ones appear to have rectitude, we should not concern ourselves with what they are in private. Well, we've seen a lot of this sort of um, tension around the world, haven't we, this last 12 months or, or four years, I suppose and not only in America, but in Australia as well. But back to Joseph and Mary and Zacharias and Elizabeth, these most ordinary of ordinary people. It was to them God came. 
And one of the reasons why God came to them, because their lives were not sullied by the world. My life gets, life gets sullied by the world, I'm sure yours does too. Isn't that wonderful? It means the simple of, simplest of us, the least and lowliest of us, can live and move and have our being in the very presence of God. Enjoying a wonder and glory in the presence of God we can never enjoy if we get caught up in what is called the human rat race. The frightening thing is, because we see ourselves as having importance, we may miss out on walking day by day with Jesus in the commonplace things of our ordinary lives. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So, some thoughts to ponder. Um, the the uh, chapters in here, the, the things that are talked about, uh, I'll give you the chapter headings before I close off. The way God does things, the bond made of God, the Magnificat, Christmas is supernatural, abandonment to God, the people God chose, God's simple people, mind-blowing, the place God chose, crowded out, Bethlehem, when the curtain was pulled back. I hope I'm whetting your appetite to go and read this on my blog. Here's the next page. No room, no room at the inn. God's distance planning. His name is Saviour. His name is Emmanuel. The birth and death of Jesus. His name is Wonderful. His name is Counselor. That's a wonderful um, chapter, that one. His name is Mighty God. His name is Everlasting Father. His name is Peace. These are all names given to Jesus in the Bible. The world is God's. Where is God? You might ask that question when you look at the world. A bit about the all-powerful devil. The men on the sidelines. A man whose heart was open to the Holy Spirit. And then a bit about Herod. And today, what can we think about today when we ponder all these things? So that's it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. I'm getting close to 100 subscriptions now, which is quite amazing, really. Uh, they just seem to keep popping up every now and then. So those who subscribe, I hope you are following up on things on here. And uh, yes, I will still be doing some photographic things uh, and other things, book reviews and whatever. But uh, for the moment, today, I am just wanting to concentrate on Jesus, what some people say, the reason for the season, the real meaning of Christmas. So don't forget to follow those links I'm going to put in my blog there and uh, have a good read and think about it and how that applies to your life and to mine. I've got to think about it too <coughs> and to my family. So now I'm going to press the button and see if this stops now. Thanks for watching.